Okay, just to make sure that uh, we'll get through the presentation, I'm probably just going to do some quick round of introductions and and uh, um, you know say say something briefly about how this came to be. Um, so Ken and Yuri and Ryan, thanks again uh, for joining us today at MyChamp. It's the Michigan Integrated Center of Health Analytics and Medical Prediction, really sort of a journal style you know group that's interested in not only methodology but interesting topic areas that crosses the intersection between health and medicine and methodology. So for, for today, our talk is uh, uh, really around uh, promoting data harmonization to evaluate vaccine hesitancy in low middle income countries, approaches and applications. And I have to say, you know, this was a very unique project or research that, that, came, that came to pass primarily because, you know, this, init this got initiated at the Center of Global Health Equity, where we were really trying to facilitate engagement and interactions across the University of Michigan. You know, sometimes we're very siloed in our different sort of uh, schools and our different departments. But the challenge we had at the Center of Global Health Equity was to say, hey, you know, can we do something different? Can we, um, you know, can we take data and can we take meaningful and important, um, you know, uh, public health questions? And, and how do we think about solutions or potential problems in different ways? So I got introduced to Ken and Yuri, uh, who are both from the Department of Political Science uh, and very much interested in, in election data and violence. Um, and at the same time, Ryan, uh, who's our impact scholar, uh, had just joined us at the Center of Global Health Equity and has a, you know, an interest in, 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 in infections and vaccinations and had also access to publicly available World Bank data. Um, and so we said, okay, well, can we take this World Bank data and in some ways, you know, kind of harmonize it with public available data around, um, you know, election or violence. And it stimulated a really interesting project. And, and so I was hoping today that, uh, you know, Ken, Yuri and Ryan, tell us a little bit about how this, uh, how this came to pass. Um, and so thanks again for joining us. And uh, Ryan, I'll have you uh, start off, I guess, and take it away. Hey, thanks so much, Akbar. And Yuri, are you able to um, <clears throat> share the slides? Perfect, great. Um, yep, so thanks so much for the introduction, Akbar, and it's also worth noting um, there are a few other people involved in this project, um, Patrick, Ciro, um, Patrick Grady and Jeffrey Sibo, who are also on right now, but also um, Amy Pienta and um, Kirani Renault um, in ICPSR, who have also been instrumental to this project. Uh, next slide, please. So health inequities are really driven by many factors beyond the um, health and demographic factors which you see in health research. For example, um, economics, consider people living in an urban informal settlement who don't have um, proper employment. They, they suffer from food insecurity and inability to pay for medical care. Think about climate change and environmental factors. For example, in Bangladesh, people um, are often displaced due to flooding or um, suffer um, from dengue outbreaks because of um, issues in sanitation and water. And also social disparities, consider um, marginalized populations and the um, disproportionate burden of non-communicable diseases on those populations. But despite all these different factors um, which um, impact health inequities, work in public health is often siloed, as is the data we collect. Um, but at the University of Michigan, the Center for Global Health Equity is working to, um, to um, solve this problem by drawing um, connections between different groups and different disciplines across the university and our collaborative universities. Next slide, please. One um, prime example of um, health inequities being um, complex and drawing from many different factors is vaccination hesitancy. The World Health Organization um, constructed a framework for vaccination hesitancy called the Behavioral and Social Drivers Framework. This looks at how people think and feel about vaccines, the social processes in vaccinations, leading to the motivation and ultimately vaccination. Um, through some analyses we did in Kenya, we found that government trust is a massive factor in vaccination um, hesitancy. But not much work has actually considered um, the impact of government trust and related issues such as electoral violence or elective competitiveness on vaccination hesitancy. Next slide, please. So we, we started considering this research question, under what conditions are people more willing to take the vaccination? Next slide, please. We took this, the following hypothesis. People are more willing to take the vaccination if the local level of political violence is low, 
local elections are all local elections are highly competitive. Next slide, please. But obviously we need quite a few different types of data to test these hypotheses. We need data on vaccination acceptance or hesitance, data on political violence and data on electoral outcomes. And there's currently no data set which contains all three of those um, pieces of data. I'll now hand over to Yuri who will discuss um, some of the issues in the data. Sure, so there are several uh, barriers to conducting this type of research. Um, and um, the main one is that each of these uh, different data sets has a different type of geographic support, which uh, you know, we can understand as that the area shape uh, associated with a variable's uh, geographic measurements. So for instance, uh, survey data on vaccine acceptance and hesitance uh, are often more typically observed at the level of a household. Um, for that household, we typically do not have its exact address for anonymity purposes. We typically have, uh, if anything, we'll have the, uh, the location of the primary sampling unit, whether it's a town or some kind of geographic unit. Uh, for political violence, uh, those data are typically organized as uh, point level coordinates. So it's a latitude and longitude associated with the location of an event. And they'll also be time stamped and have some additional attributes associated with what happened and, and who committed the violence. Um, and for elections, those are typically uh, collected at the level of some discrete geographic unit. Uh, so in this case, electoral constituency, which may be like a congressional district. Sometimes if we're lucky, we can get these at the level of electoral precinct, which are much smaller units. But still, uh, the, the units at which these three uh, types of data are observed are not automatically compatible with each other, right? So it's not clear how to combine these into a single data set for analysis. Uh, uh, in terms of data structure, you're talking about combining tabular data with vectorized polygons representing geographic areas, sometimes with roster images uh, for other types of ge geospatial data. The borders of these units may be misaligned. So let's say we wanna make inferences about uh, these things at the county level, but we, but we only have congressional district level data for elections. Those borders do not completely align and they may be non-nested. And some of the data may not have ge georeferenced information. Like for instance, the survey data may simply have the names of the towns in which people live, but not the latitude and longitude associated with them. So um, there's, there's other concerns as well, which includes the measurement strategies that different data sources take. Um, and for example, for the study of violence, there are myriad different data sets, uh, some of which are automated uh, in terms of uh, how they collect information about events, some of which are manually curated, uh, some of which use media sources, others which use government sources. And if you use two different data sets, you, that may give you two different, two very different sets of results. And there's also the challenge of distinguishing case-specific idiosyncrasies from general patterns. So like, what does country A tell us about country B? And what is the, basically, what, what is the scope of evidence that we need in order to actually uh, confirm these hypotheses or not? Is it enough to show that this relationship holds in one geographic context and not worry about whether that result is transportable to others? And in studying uh, survey data in particular, there's also the problem of dealing with essentially what are snapshots of public attitudes. That's what we observe in survey data. Uh, people are asked a specific question on a specific day. And we do not know if that's the same attitude that people will still have a month from now if you conduct the survey again. So how do we distinguish these snapshots of public attitudes from stable long-term trends in order to make inferences about you know, what predicts vaccine hesitancy in the long run? And so this is why we, uh, uh, basically approach this, uh, th th this particular empirical problem with uh, a new infrastructure that we're building at uh, the Institute for Social Research called SunGeo or the Subnational Geospatial Data Archive. Uh, we consider this a, a great use case for this infrastructure uh, precisely because this is a project that was organized around three challenges that are, that are quite relevant to this particular problem. First, how to properly integrate spatially misaligned data. Um, let's say you your original data is at the level of one type of geographic unit, but you want to make inferences at another type of geographic unit. How do we account for differences in measurement across primary sources, as I just discussed with the violence data? And also, how do we facilitate assessments of generalizability and robustness? Um, and so all of this 
um, it, it is integrated in the platform that we're building, to which uh, which essentially has three three uh, parallel components. One is a user friendly web interface. Another is an open source software package, and then we also have a data repository through which uh, uh, users can store uh, some of their own data, so that your replication data does not die with the paper that you just published, so it can get a second life in the hands of other researchers. Um, and, and essentially, this is um, what the, the web interface allows users to do is to basically transform multiple sources of seemingly incompatible data onto a common standard set of units of analysis. Also to integrate these data in a way that minimizes potential measurement error and bias. And then also to easily replicate this entire process in a different geographic and historical setting. So for example, in our case, the input data up here might be uh, you know, the surveys on vaccine hesitancy, event data on violence, data on elections, and the output data will be a single analysis ready data set that we can just simply plug right into Stata or R and start running regressions. What this data set looks like is entirely up to us, right? It can be a household level data set with measures of local violence and elections for each household, or it can be a more aggregate data set at the district or county level, uh, census tract level, basically any relevant unit of analysis that you might think of. And so, I think Yuri just froze, or am I the only one who's frozen? <laughs> no, he has for me as well. Yuri froze. Uh, we'll have to give him a minute here. Sure. Hmm. If I knew what his next slide was, I could pick up. <laughs> Well, let me, uh, I don't know if uh, me sending a chat to him will be helpful or not, but I'll just let him know he froze. Um, in the meantime, does anybody have any questions that they could ask either Ken or Ryan about, um, about sort of our framing, our thinking? Vidya, you look like you want to ask a question. <laughs> I just think this whole thing is so incredible, actually, because, you know, you know, I work a lot with um, refugee and uh, asylum seeker populations, and these people have gone through a lot of violence. And so we think a lot about vaccine uptake in these communities, you know, and actually we lack a lot of data. So when they come as unaccompanied minors, we just, the U.S. government just says, you know, as a blanket policy, just give all of them vaccines again, regardless of whether they've had vaccines before. Um, and unless they actually have their vaccine cards, which usually get lost as they swim across the river or whatever, you know, even when they come from Afghanistan, we don't, um, we just give them vaccines again, actually. And so, um, you know, I find this really interesting to think about, like, what vaccines have they gotten already? We find actually in the Northern Triangle countries, a lot of them have actually gotten vaccines. They have pretty good vaccine uptake over there despite the extreme violence. But I've never thought about the election and how that interplays with all of this. And I'm really curious about how that, how you thought about that and why you thought about that and what does that have to do with anything? So I'm really interested in that. Well, let me, let me try to continue without slides right now just to kind of talk through a little bit of our approach. So, um, and let's see. Ryan actually may have a, I uh, have slides. Yeah, um, I will okay. um, send the slides to you, Ken. Okay, we, can you just project you them? Just, Brian? You want to just uh, you want to just scroll from there? Yep. Ah, this is the perils of Zoom, I guess. Yep. So the next okay, slide. You want to go to the next slide? Okay, yeah, I, so the, we, we have an R package, which um, people can, can use, but we're also pretty soon going to uh, have a web interface where you can choose your country. So you could choose Bangladesh. Um, we don't have, but, but we don't necessarily, oh, Yuri, sorry, you're on. You're much better at this than I am. Why don't you go ahead? <laughs> uh, yeah, sorry, folks. Uh, internet outages tend to happen at the worst possible time. Um, so I'm going to try to bring my slides back up here. Uh, 
see. Right. There we go. Right. Okay, here we go. Um, so, um, so essentially, um, this is the process that we used here, the R package, which is already available to uh, uh, you know, to anyone with an internet connection and uh, and who is an active R user. Uh, but, but in the meantime, this is just a, just an illustration of some of its potential. Uh, there's going to be much more data loaded into it, and uh, and uh, we hope to have the the whole uh, uh, system up in beta in the coming weeks. Now, to get back to our research question and show you how we're actually going to apply this system to uh, to the hypotheses at hand. Um, so step one is to get the raw data. Um, and the, the raw data here, uh, as we already mentioned, they're coming through three different types, vaccine surveys, political violence, and elections. Uh, uh, Ryan, do you want to give us a, a quick background on the, va on, the, on the vaccine surveys that we'll be using here? Um, Yep, absolutely. Um, these are the World Bank's high frequency phone surveys. So these um, started in May of 2020 in, I believe, 56 countries. Um, and they were longitudinal mobile phone surveys. The aim of these surveys was to um, collect information on um, the socioeconomic impact of COVID-19, but they included some questions on vaccination, which is why they were quite appealing to us. All right, and uh, and so we we want to integrate these uh, vaccine surveys with data on political violence, which in this case we're we have a whole uh, vast collection of political violence data that is in the SunGeo system, and uh, these originally came from uh, kind of a predecessor to SunGeo called XSub, uh, cross uh, national data on subnational violence. Uh, at the atomic level, these data look like uh, basically who did what to whom, when and where. So each observation tells you about the location, uh, date, uh, actors, targets, and tactics associated with a violent event. There are about two dozen uh, uh, data sources that are currently in the system, including very large and widely used uh, data sets like ACLID and UCDP. Um, and, um, and, and then we're going to integrate these data also with uh, an additional source of data on elections uh, from uh, the CLIA project. Now, Ken, do you want to give a quick uh, background on, on those election data, what they look like? I'll just be very brief. Um, every country that holds elections holds uh, elections for lower houses of parliament. Um, they might also have elections for presidents or for upper houses, but um, to uh, allow for comparison across any country in the world, we have the uh, constituency level election results for lower houses of parliament for most of the countries of the world for most of the elections they've ever held. And then in this particular study, we're going to use a measure of electoral competitiveness, which is essentially how competitive are the seats in the local area. And you want to think about that in theoretical terms as, um, you know, uh, is this kind of a safe seat or safe area for a particular party, or is it highly contested? And the idea is the more highly contested it is, the more the leaders actually reach out and try to help people to win their vote. Right. Thanks, Ken. And, and yes, so this all goes back to this um, literature in political science about political accountability. And the idea is that political accountability rests on constituents' ability to punish or reward political authorities for their performance. Uh, and uh, and where political leaders face a real risk of defeat of the ballot box, there is a lot of evidence that this electoral pressure can inform policy. And we're interested in, in uh, how this impacts uh, you know, people's willingness to take a vaccine, whether a more competitive political Oh no, we uh, lost. You know, incumbents feel like uh, okay. versus whether um, they. Um, um, they will avoid uh, actions that might seem uh, politically unpopular locally. And you know, this is an open empirical question, and it's one that we want to test here. Um, and so once we get these data, um, uh, there's a little bit of pre-processing that's involved. The survey data have to be geocoded. Um, and, uh, and then the uh, variables of interest have to be extracted. And in, in our case, uh, we're particularly interested in uh, this question of intent to, to receive the vaccine. Um, 
and uh, in most cases, those questions are, are worded along the lines of, um, do you intend to take the COVID-19 vaccine if the opportunity presents itself or some variant thereof, right? Um, but we also looked at um, you know, awareness of the vaccine as well as whether people have taken it. But in this particular case, um, we want to um, focus in on this intent question uh, in particular because that is potentially the most revealing about vaccine hesitancy. So um, the next step is once we have geocoded these survey records. Um, can so I, can I ask a question? question or yeah, yeah, yes, please do. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm curious because um, in our experience, COVID vaccine hesitancy is very different than other vaccine hesitancy. Have you found that? Are you only looking at COVID vaccine hesitancy or? Yeah, video, um, we, this was primarily around COVID vaccines, uh, given sort of the, the interest and environment. Uh, Ryan right now is actually looking at uptake of other vaccinations too, um, and he's doing some survey work among refugee populations in northern Kenya, as well as populations in, 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 in Bangladesh. At some point, Ryan and Vidya, you guys both have to talk, uh, because I could imagine a lot of synergy there about, around your interest, Vidya, especially among uh, immigrants coming in or displaced populations. Yep, we were actually chatting in the chat, so it's already um, okay. emotional. It's already well. started. <laughs> That's good. That's the whole point. <laughs> Yeah, and that's potentially yet another generalizability question that we could try to answer uh, with the, with the system. So I think that I think that's a uh, that's very much on point. Um, now, now once we've established where these sampling units are, we can link them to administrative units. In this case, what you're seeing here on this map are uh, second tier administrative units within uh, Indonesia. So these are kind of the, their equivalent of like a U.S. county. Um, and uh, and that's the level at, at which we're going to pull down the the additional data from some geo. Um, in theory, this could be any other unit. These could be grid cells. These could be constituencies. These could be anything else. This is just purely illustrative here. Um, and so, for instance, we want to be able to merge uh, uh, the, the survey responses with some geo data on violence. So, what you're seeing here, darker shades uh, represent more political violence. Uh, over the past uh, two decades. Um, and so here as well, there's a, you know, there's a large literature in, in political science about how exposure to violence affects preferences and behavior in the short term and the long term. And one of these effects is potentially decline in trust toward the government and their ability to keep citizens safe. So we wanna see if that's actually true, uh, if, if, uh, um, if this uh, decreased trust toward the government correlates with uh, more vaccine hesitancy. To do that, we want to be able to extract the data on violence and assign them, you know, spatially join them to uh, these, uh, these individual survey, uh, uh, household survey responses. But then we're going to do the same thing for competitiveness of elections. Uh, the measure that we're using here, uh, now there are multiple measures of competitiveness, as Ken mentioned. Uh, the one that we're using here is essentially one minus the uh, ele ele the vote share margin. So the closer this is to one, the more competitive it is. That means there's basically a razor thin margin separating the winner from the from the loser. If this is closer to zero, then that means the incumbent is very safe, or whoever is running is gonna have double digit uh, margin of victory. Uh, and so from the standpoint of election watching, that's probably not the most interesting election to to keep your eye on because it's pretty clear who's going to win it. Um, and so here as well, we're going to uh, assign the level of electoral competitiveness uh, in the local context of each uh, uh, household to those survey responses. And so now we've we spatially integrated these data. We've done that for four countries, Ethiopia, Indonesia, Kenya, Malawi. Now, three of the four of these uh, are special and that these are panel surveys with repeated observations per household. So we can actually see how attitudes toward vaccination change over time. Uh, but as we started exploring these data, we noticed something interesting, which is that the same households actually give different answers across rounds. Um, so for example, look, let's look at Indonesia, as we're already on that case. So what you're seeing here is a matrix that shows the percentage of households that gave the same answer to the intent question over round seven, four through seven, which are the rounds for which we have these um, uh, these vaccine intent questions. And now this is irrespective of whether they said yes or no, or don't know, basically this, did they give the same exact answer? And 
from round four to round five, 73 percent of households gave the same answer that they did in the previous round. By the next round, this dropped to 65 percent. By round seven, this fell to just over half. And so there are several ways to look at this. One is to look at this as a kind of a statistical nuisance and just try to ignore. The other is to um, kind of treat this as a theoretical quantity of interest that we want to explain. So this means that we're going to need to somehow account for potential changes in, in, in a household level preferences across survey rounds and use that to then understand how in the long run, uh, how the system will eventually converge toward more or less vaccine hesitancy. And so we need an empirical strategy that accounts for this dynamic, right? And so one way to do this is to model this whole thing as a stochastic process. Uh, so here, our quantity of interest is the conditions under which a household might express stable pro-vaccine preferences across survey rounds. Um, and so we can think of this as uh, a markup chain with two potential states. Um, state one is yes to the vaccine. State two is no to the vaccine. Now we can potentially extend this to also include a third category of don't knows or prefer not to says. Uh, but just for illustrative purposes, let's just keep this binary for, for, for now and look at how these two types of responses vary over time. Now, there are different ways to model this empirically. Um, and I'm happy to talk about this more in Q&A. Uh, just for the sake of this presentation, we'll just tell you we're, we're just not doing anything fancy here. This is just a very standard uh, generalized linear modeling framework where we use a logit link to model the transition probabilities going from one, round, from one state to another. And so uh, on the right-hand side, you have a whole series of covariates, which include you know, electoral competitiveness and violence, as well as other things that we should control for at the household level, like things like age, gender, uh, as well as other contextual variables like road density and terrain, economic development, uh, things like that. And uh, by interacting all these covariates with uh, essentially a temporal lag of uh, preferences during the last round, this gives us separate sets of coefficients, one for households that said no during the previous round, and another set of coefficients for households that say yes during the previous round. And this ena enables us then to generate predicted probabilities and construct transition matrices to see how this uh, stochastic process actually evolves over time. And so the transition matrix um, will essentially look something like this. So each cell in this transition matrix conveys the probability of transitioning from one state in the rows to another state in the columns under different types of counterfactual scenarios. So what you're seeing here is the transition matrix for a median household in Indonesia. And what this tells us is that for households who said no during the previous round, for the median household, about th they have about a 33% chance of switching to yes during the next round. Right? And for households who said yes in the previous round, they have a 93% chance of remaining yes in the next round and only a 7% chance of going back to no, right? And so, I mean, at glance, this looks positive. This looks like the probability of, of staying a yes is higher than the probability of staying a no, but uh, ultimately we wanna see how this whole system evolves over the long run. So over the long run, the stochastic process is gonna reach some equilibrium state, right? And in which the probability of being in each state remains unchanged. Um, and this is what's called the stationary distribution. Now, there are different ways of deriving it. Uh, eigenvalue uh, decomposition is how we did it here. And this basically tells us that over the long run, if, this, uh, if we were to observe this survey over round 10 and round 20 and round 100, round infinity, eventually this will converge to this distribution where 76% of households in Indonesia are going to say yes and they're going to stick to yes. And then well, about a quarter of them are going to are going to be no, right? And so this is how the scenario will unfold for the median household in Indonesia living in an area with median levels of electoral competitiveness, median levels of violence, and everything else. Um, you know, whether such households actually exist in in, in reality, that's a separate question. But here we're just uh, uh, we're looking at different counterfactuals and how this stationary distribution will change under those counterfactuals. So let's actually test these hypotheses that Ryan outlined in the beginning. Are people in fact more willing to take a vaccine if the local levels of local violence are low? 
and if local elections are highly competitive. Well, let's see. So here we regenerated this stationary distribution under kind of different counterfactual scenarios. Um, so keeping everything else equal, let's look at a, a hypothetical scenario in which we have a household living in a high violence location, basically 99th percentile of violence uh, observed in the country versus one in the low violence household, basically the first percentile. And what we see here is in fact, as we expected, less violence correlates with more vaccine acceptance, uh, about 89% of Indonesian households uh, living in a high violence area, living in a low violence area are, are gonna commit to saying yes to the vaccine in the long run, versus 73% uh, in a high violence area. So the lower the level of the violence, the higher the level of that vaccine acceptance. Okay, so, so far so good. Let's also look at the second hypothesis. Yuri, may I interject yes. a second? Please, go so, ahead. Uh, and I know we don't know this, but pre the presumption here could be one of many things, right? That if you're in violence area that either people are not bringing in the vaccines to allow for vaccine uh, you know, delivery rather than potential vaccine hesitancy or because that's not something we would have measured, right? Like if there's a high violence area, then there's a possibility that they just weren't able to distribute to those locations. Exactly. Yeah. So this does not tell us anything about the mechanisms at work, right? This is uh, uh, at this point, all we can competently say is that there's a correlation and the, and the association here is beyond what we would expect by chance. Now, whether, uh, you know, high violence areas uh, see more vaccine hesitancy, whether that's due to distributional uh, problems, whether that's due to um, um, you know, lack of trust in institutions, whether that's due to something else, that's Kind of the next step in analysis, right? The, 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 that 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 we would do. Um, in this case, we're simply looking at right whether there's an association, and in fact, it seems there is one, and it's in the expected direction, right? Um, and the same thing for electoral competitiveness. In more competitive areas, in this case, 83% uh, of of households are expected to say yes to the vaccine in the long run, and in less competitive areas, you know, the bottom one percentile, uh, only 53% are going to be willing to take the vaccine. Um, and again, this doesn't tell us anything necessarily about, about the mechanisms at work, um, although this does tell us that you know, there's something there. There's something there, and it's worth looking into. And, uh, and of course, we, we, we want to you know, delve into those mechanisms a bit more before we can make more specific policy recommendations based on this research. Um, but this is where everything starts. Um, and so, so far, we found that at least in Indonesia, both of these hypotheses seem to hold. Uh, there is indeed a more willingness to take the vaccine where local violence is low and local elections are competitive. But do these results actually generalize to other countries? And so, Let's take a look. So we're, we're, we basically took the exact same research design that we just showed you, uh, and we applied the same thing to Kenya and to Malawi, the two other countries for which we have these repeated survey observations. And in Kenya, we, in fact, found a very similar relationship with actually a lower baseline level of, uh, of vaccine acceptance. Uh, but it's in the, it moves in the same direction. Low violence areas, 75% yes. High violence areas, 52% yes. For Malawi, it's a bit more of a wash, right? It's a, uh, it kind of seems like it goes in the opposite direction, but the confidence intervals here are pretty wide. So, uh, so this is all within the margin of error. Um, and in part that's potentially because there's not as much violence to observe within Malawi. Uh, uh, and there are other possibilities as well. Um, as for the second uh, hypothesis, uh, once again, we see the same pattern in Kenya as we do in Indonesia, more competitiveness, more willingness to take the vaccine. Uh, whereas in Malawi, the difference is in the same direction, but once again, um, it's uh, not statistically significantly different from what we would expect to happen just by chance. So, uh, so we're unable to draw a definitive conclusion for that particular country. Um, Yuri, was, so, it, was the Malawi data set um, a smaller data set in terms of the out, uh, uh, assessment of the outcome was the less surveys. Is that why we could, I mean, could that be one of the reasons? Presumably the sample there was a little mm -hmm. much more. Uh, 
so the sample was smaller and also we have fewer rounds. I think in, in Malawi, we have only two or three rounds and some of the others we have three or four. Um, and, um, and so, so yeah, that, that, that's, that's, that's certainly uh, part of it. If you have more rounds of observation, you know, you have more data, you have more statistical power to, uh, to detect these effects. Um, either way, I mean, this is, um, uh, basically we're unable to make a, you know, a conclusive, uh, assessment here in one direction or another, uh, there's simply too much uncertainty. Um, and, and again, if, you know, we can, we can view this, uh, basically as a null relationship. And then we, the next step might be to try to explain this heterogeneity across countries somewhat. What is different about Malawi? Is it a problem with the data or is it something something in the water or, 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 or there's something in the local environment that that's that's making these relationships less weak than they are in these other cases right and um, yeah so uh, so the answer is whether these results generalize partly right so the hypotheses hold for two of the three countries um, and uh, as we just mentioned this could be due to the being pure survey rounds in Malawi violence being more rare could be due to underlying heterogeneities and empirical relationships that are that deserve closer inspection. But thanks to some geo and this data harmonization routine, we can also exclude a lot of potential uh, causes of this heterogeneity. We know that it's not due to differences in data sources across countries. Um, we're using the same sources of data for violence, for elections, for for the control variables as well. Uh, we know it's not due to differences in the the transport geospatial transformation methods that are used in these different countries because we're using the same system, we're using the same routines. We know it's not due to differences in measurement or units of analysis, we're standardized as much as we can. Uh, and we're using the same model in these cases. So a lot of times when uh, you know, you're browsing the journals and you see studies from two different countries that, that yield two different results, it's, it's hard to tell whether those differences are due to genuine heterogeneities in empirical relationships or do these measurement issues and inconsistencies in research design. So this allows us to exclude that and kind of move on to more substantive questions about what is behind this heterogeneity, right? Um, and so, um, so context matters, right? Context matters in determining these trajectories of vaccine hesitancy. Um, Indonesia and Kenya, we see that you know, high levels of political violence and low uh, competitiveness of elections correlates with more vaccine hesitancy. Uh, we do not find strong effects in Malawi. Uh, but again, this is all all purely illustrative at this point, and it's all fodder for future research, future investigation. And now I'm going to turn things over to Ryan, who's going to put this in a bigger picture of what this means for public health. So, um, Yuri, can, can I just ask you quickly ask a question here? Yeah, first of all, I, I think this is just a fascinating presentation. Yeah, so, uh, so I know that you under, you try to understand actually the relationship between you know these two endpoints and uh, vaccination hesitancy. So, but what about the correlation between the local violence and the election competitiveness? Right, I think it can go either way. So, I, I wonder if your team has looked into this. Mm -hmm. No, yeah, I'm mute. So, 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 absolutely. There's a, in, in fact, a, a member of our research team, uh, it's on Geo and Pitcher, who studies this question exactly, mm -hmm. uh, looking at a, a, a relationship between violence and elections, and actually studying that relationship faces a lot of the same challenges that we're facing here because data on elections is not designed to be compatible or readily, uh, you know, integratable with data on violence. Uh, so all the same problems that we see here it, um, methodologically are still present in that in that research as well. And I mean, that's a whole other can of worms because there's both research on how competitiveness of elections affects post-electoral violence. There's research on how violence impacts uh, the competitiveness of elections as well as turnout. Uh, so for instance, uh, one of my, one of my previous projects, uh, looking at the long-term effects of exposure to Stalinist repression in the Soviet Union showed that places that has historically have been exposed to more, uh, violence at the hands of the regime experienced lower turnout, but also more kind of anti-regime votes. Um, so, so a lot of this depends on, on who's committing the violence, uh, whether they're still in power. Um, and in that particular 
case, we found that kind of these two effects that go in opposite directions, basically exposure to violence means you're going to be more anti-government, but you're also less likely to vote. So those two things kind of cancel each other out. Um, how this manifests itself in, in places like Kenya and Indonesia is a whole separate question. And, and in fact, uh, one that I think our system is well, well equipped to address. Thank you. So we're linking this back to um, the prior literature. This is the first um, study to ever look at the association between electoral violence and um, election competitiveness. Um, but there are a um, few other studies that looked at the impact of trust on vaccination hesitancy. In 2019, Kennedy published a paper um, looking at the association between childhood vaccination hesitancy and um, trust of political elites and experts and found that this trust was associated with hesitancy to childhood vaccines. As I mentioned at the beginning, we also carried out an analysis in Kenya and saw the government distrust was associated with vaccination hesitancy. Um, it is worth noting a few things over here. This is hesitancy, not actual vaccination. Um, so we, you might find social desirability bias in this or when it comes time to vaccination, people might change their mind at that moment. Um, and it's also worth noting um, when it comes to distrust, um, the cadence of the government's tone on hesitance on vaccination um, is a big factor. If the, go if the government um, does not support vaccinations, that can be, um, and, and people distrust the government, um, that could still, that can then be positively associated with vaccination. But hey, Ryan, I think we just lost you too. <laughs> We're having some electrical stuff. Oh, sorry. I, I was just saying, um, if the government is anti-vaccination, this uh, Ryan, we can't hear you. You can't hear me. Um, and there was some. It sounded like there was some kind of shorting going on on that side. There was just some electrical uh, sound. Try again. Can you hear me now? Uh, it's very low. But anyway, I think. Oh, can, can you hear me? Yeah. I can hear you perfectly fine. Can you hear? Can you hear Ryan? Okay. Yeah, can you hear me now? Is that working? Yeah, there you go. A little bit better. Okay, great. Okay. Um, I'll go a bit closer yeah. to the microphone. But overall, we recommend that um, that to combat um, vaccination hesitancy, um, efforts are made to decrease violence and increase electoral competitiveness, which is obviously quite a big task. Beyond that, you can also look into. Um, separating the association people have between vaccination and political institutions. And I think Larry has a very nice comment uh, similar to what you just su suggested. And Larry, I don't know if you want to verbalize it or uh, you just want me to read it out. <laughs> it's a very good point, by the way. Go ahead, Larry. I don't think we, we can hear you, Larry. So if you're trying to say something, we can't hear you. Okay, I'll just read it off the comments. Well, uh, so, I, I think everybody can read it, right? Yeah. On the chat? I hope, hopefully. <laughs> They're not on their iPhone, but yes. <laughs> but yeah, uh, so, yeah so, so good point, right? So Essentially yeah. what he's calling for is that depending on your partisanship or your political leanings, you might, that's going to affect your political vaccinations. Um, so we don't have a measure in this model of the, of the political persuasion, let's say, of the winning party or of the, the losing party or whatever, um, or of the household's partisanship, for instance. So all those things could interact in very interesting ways depending on the country and the context. Like it's obviously affected the American situation. Um, there are strong partisan correlations in vaccine uptake, uh, the COVID-19, but increasingly other vaccines. Was, was that true in, in these countries as well? I guess um, maybe uh, many of us don't know the, I, I know there was an election in Kenya, for example, this past year, but I'm curious, uh, did, did folks kind of break along party uh, lines for these issues too? Ryan, were, those, were, were the households asked about their politics? Um, no, they weren't. I didn't see any evidence of that out of Kenya. But you do find that in the U.S. that it's very um, aligned with party lines. Yeah, you might be able to do something like situate the household within a particular location that you know the general partisanship of that location, and you could do some imputation to the household. That could be possible. That that would be a very interesting little line line of research. 
Yeah, I would just add that uh, what, one challenge in, uh, in addressing uh, Larry's question empirically is that, um, you know, you know the, these party alignments on this uh, vaccine question vary from country to country, right? And from the standpoint of kind of scaling up to potentially a cross-national type of meta-analysis, um, you know, we need measures that um, are not dependent on basically this kind of local knowledge about like which party is in favor, which party is against. Um, and so the, so there's several ways to go about this. So, so one of the advantages of the electoral competitiveness variable is that uh, it could be measured in the same exact way, no matter, no matter what country you're looking at. Uh, all you need for that is, in this case, the, the electoral vote margin. Um, there, are, there are ways that you that you can kind of uh, adopt a more general framework by, yeah, you know, as kind of suggested, maybe interacting this with uh, uh, whether the the incumbent party in a given in a given location is is the same as you know the national incumbent, or or whether it's more right leaning, more left leaning. You know, there we can incorporate party ideology in this to the extent to which we can we can put these parties on the, on this similar type of spectrum cross-nationally, sometimes that's, that's easier said than done. Um, but, uh, but, but yeah, that's, that's always a trade-off between kind of making inferences that, that seem valid given what we know about the local context, including in the United States, and whether we can then see if the same exact patterns hold across the world. And, and, and for that, you know, we need a, uh, you know, we, we need a, a research design that's transportable and where measures are consistent in, in their meaning. Um, so that's, you know, there's, it's definitely a challenge that exists in this literature and one, one that we hope that we can address. You know, Brahmaji, also just to refer to your uh, question about the Kenyan election this time, you know, I, I would say that the sentiment in Kenya was a bit of a surprise as to who who won. It was by clearly a close enough margin that it had to, it had to go to the Supreme, Supreme Court. But you wonder whether, you know, when, when there is a, a potential suggestion, um, you, know, whether, you know, whether it's gonna be competitive or not, that one agenda item should be something that's gonna be important for the people, that this could have a meaningful, you know, potential impact if in mean, the politicians were to know that some of these, you know, some of these health related items are clearly important, right? And sometimes in low middle income countries, it's not very clear as to, how much of an agenda um, health is in their platform. I would say that in this particular Kenyan election, there wasn't much talk about health or vaccinations or anything like that. And for, for, uh, for, a, for a, an election where they thought that, um, uh, you know, the current president uh, would vote, would, would, um, uh, would, who, had, who had said uh, his preferred candidate was someone else, and that person did not end up winning. Um, it, it, you know, you could really think about for the potential importance of you know candidates to run on a on a health platform too. You know, I, I have one other question for for you guys. I mean, this is fantastic work. I, I sorry I joined late. You know, I always find these analyses you know so interesting, and um, I, I guess you know sometimes. And I don't know if it makes complete sense in this situation, but I wonder how you guys think of causal arrows, especially when you come up with the recommendations. Because, you know, what one thing I'll say is it, it wasn't a huge proportion, but you know, the the whole vaccine hesitancy in the U.S. created some strange bedfellows, right? Like people who traditionally, and I'm just making up stereotypes here, but might have been like you know, folks who have thought like, oh, I'm very holistic. I don't want anything in my, you know, body that's like not natural and might have fallen on like almost the extreme of the political left where suddenly like, you know, retweeting on social media comments by like, you know, people on the far right. And it was this really strange thing. And I, I wonder, you know, do you ever think that like, because I, I have heard of things like people re- affiliating parties because they felt like, well, the vaccine vaccine policies of this party more aligned with my vaccine. Like it almost became like something that drove the causal, in, like the causal arrows in a, a different direction. And I just wonder how you guys think about this. That's just one example of like how sometimes these, you know, the, these causal relationships can be much different than what we 
look at at first blush. Going to take that, Yuri? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I would certainly agree that we can think of scenarios in which the causal arrow goes in the opposite direction and, and where uh, incumbents that have been previously safe uh, now find themselves more vulnerable due to the choices that they made in, in the public health policies that they adopted during the pandemic. Um, and I, I think um, uh, also, a lot, I mean, a lot depends on uh, the timing in which you observe the, the, these uh, these policies being enacted, and because and, uh, these these things don't become crystallized overnight, right? So, like in Mar in March of 2020. Um, the NPIs were not yet as, politi as politically charged as they became later on that year, right? And lockdowns and, and things of that sort did not become politically salient until you know, until a few months later. Um, and and chances are, if you, if you were to, to do a study looking at the effect of you know, any epidemic response on people's political attitudes, you you would get a very you know, result in uh, early in the pandemic that you would later on when all this has been kind of incorporated into, into party platforms. Um, it's a, yeah, so, 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 so I think there, there's definitely room for, 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 for looking at, uh, you know, empirical relationships going the opposite direction. And, you know, we are certainly not making any kinds of calls or claims at, at you know, in, in this paper, this is all purely, um, it actually purely illustrated. It, 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 it originated as kind of a use case for the system that we're building. Um, but, uh, you know, this is why, you know, people publish more than one paper, right? So they can, uh, you know, we, we, have, we have one that establishes, you know, what type of relationship then, you know, there are clearly limitations uh, to, you know, you know, how the kinds of inferences that we can draw from these results. And and to actually approach causal identification, we'll, we will need a different research design. This, this thing here won't work. We need to you know, um, find some natural experiment or instrument or uh, regression discontinuity, something. Uh, it, basically, this type of stochastic process will only tell us about how things evolve over time, not necessarily uh, which uh, which factors causally uh, are, um, if, you know, push it one way or the other. Um, and, you know, but in our case, basically for this analysis, uh, we're leaning on, on a temporal sequence a little bit uh, in, in that we're looking at violence that happened during the previous 20 years up to 2018. So this is not immediately, up, um, not immediately leading up to the pandemic, as well as uh, the most recent election results, which uh, I think can be... Uh, I'm not sure when the CLIA data were last updated, uh, Ken, but but uh, I don't think we're using the most recent version here 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 either. But basically, these these are uh, basically how the most recent, I guess, pre-pandemic election results impacted uh, public attitudes. Temporal sequence is not the same thing as causal sequence, uh, and and you know, certainly caution should be warranted. But um, you know, it, no, that's how that, yeah. that's helpful. No. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good answer, Yuri. Well, um, I don't know if there's any more questions, but we're coming up to the top of the hour. Um, and uh, it was a great, lively discussion and, and certainly helped us think about the framing of this paper too. And, uh, you know, the demonstration of sort of this platform that, uh, you know, Yuri and Ken have been working on and uh, of real value, I feel, not only to answering some of these questions, but as a whole for other questions. So, uh, keep in touch with us. Uh, happy to uh, facilitate um, other uh, connections across campus. But uh, thanks again, everyone, and have a great weekend. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, guys. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks, Yuri. Thanks. That was really great. Thanks a lot. Bye.